was almost a year ago uh, in this gym when we uh, began to talk about this project called the Duologue. And this came from the conviction that it, it's, it's better to talk to one another when we disagree than about one another when we disagree. And it's a great model that we've been doing this past year. Last week I was in Washington, D.C. I heard Arthur Brooks talking, and he was meeting with some Christian college presidents talking about what's happening not only in Christian higher education but also in our nation. Arthur Brooks is the president of the American Enterprise Institute, and he's talking about our current state of polarization, um, seen by many as being very problematic in many spheres, media, politics, and other places. And he says that the problem isn't so much anger. And this is what he writes. He says, actually, it's a very interesting fact that anger in marriage is uncorrelated with separation and divorce. The problem is when anger metastasizes into something that's much worse, which is called contempt. And contempt means that you feel somebody with whom you disagree is utterly worthless and that nothing that they say could have anything worth listening to. So here we are, 2019, followers of Jesus in our world today, living in a way that calls us to this gospel-centered way of moving forward and not towards contempt. But when it comes to those with whom we disagree, what will it look like to lead with a warm-heartedness? All around us, too often, our culture leans towards one of outrage and contempt. It's what Notre Dame sociologist Christian Smith called a cultural offense that shuts down the open exchange of ideas. So we're at a university, right? And this is a community where students can become gritty because you learn to defend good ideas, critique bad ideas, and humbly admit when your own ideas are wrong. And this is how we work it out. And we work it out in conversations, and this is what we're going to be modeling today and tonight. As I said at the outset, I hope these conversations are rich and funny and warm and amicable and instructive models of how we disagree well, something our society increasingly finds it difficult to do. And I hope these conversations help opposing sides to consider good arguments and logic and intellectual strength and poignant examples and, of course, biblical grounding, all in a spirit of warm-hearted kindness and grace. So tonight's duologue, which you're going to hear about in a few minutes, is on economics. It's our third in our series, one per semester. And this morning in chapel, we'll establish some of the biblical context for the panel conversation of Biola faculty that you'll hear tonight. So please join me in welcoming your host for the duologue, Biola's own Dr. Rick Langer and Tim Yulhoff. Thank you, Dr. Corey, and thank you guys so much for welcoming us. We're excited about the duologue uh, tonight. Let me just give a quick word of kind of explanation and context. Some of you may not have been here for one of these before, may not know exactly the idea. It's simple when you think about it. We, we tend to live in a world where there's two types of things, either things that we say whatever to, matters of taste. I don't care if you like In-N-Out and I like uh, McDonald's, it doesn't matter, it's just a matter of taste. And then there's other things that are matters of absolutes, and we tend to fight over these things, and they're enormously important. And in the Christian faith, you have those things. You have areas that are absolutely confessional commitments. If you deny the deity of Christ, you've really stepped outside of the circle of the Christian faith. It's an absolute. There's other things that are simply a matter of taste or the accidents of history. In, in the New Testament, you find people who are baptized by one person or another person, and Paul's really upset when people make a big deal out of that because it doesn't matter, whatever, who cares who the person was who did that for you. The interesting and important thing is this middle area that we tend not to talk about or even conceptualize well, and that is the area of personal convictions things that actually do matter, but which there's room to disagree on. And Paul gives us a whole chapter of Romans 14 describing those issues. In that case, about days and diets, and some people think they're enormously important, some people they don't. And he's saying, Paul says, look, I just want each of you to be convinced in your own mind. You cultivate a personal conviction, so it isn't for export, it's for personal consumption. On the other hand, it isn't just a matter of taste, because it's a conviction. And these are the things that we tend to disagree about. These are the points that become tensions for us. And these are the exact things we tend to talk about with the duologues. Issues of Christian conviction where good, well-minded, and well-intentioned Christians 
may completely disagree with one another. So we picked these controversial issues to talk about together as a community to help all of us think better and cultivate richer, deeper, and hopefully better held convictions. So our very first duologue was on politics. We thought that was particularly timely. We had a, uh, uh, one of our faculty who would identify as a conservative, and then we had a faculty member who would identify herself as being progressive. The second duologue was on, is social justice actually a hindrance to the gospel? And should the two be separated from each other, and do they affect each other? And uh, this one tonight is going to be about an interesting topic. It's going to be about money, our relationship to wealth, our relationship to capitalism. When I was an undergrad at Eastern Michigan University, Dr. Bill Bright came. We had a Campus Crusade for Christ movement there. And he was given permission to talk about anything he wanted to talk about. When you're the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, you get to speak on whatever you want. So Dr. Bright walked up to our weekly meeting. There was about uh, um, 900 students. And he sits down in a chair and he looks at the audience, undergrads, and he says, is it okay for a Christian to own a Lexus? That was it. That's all he said. And then he just looked at us. And then everybody started talking with each other and it was fascinating discussion. And then Dr. Bright kind of shocked us at the very end saying, Absolutely, it's okay for a Christian to own a Lexus. Now it continued. And so we want to continue that kind of a conversation tonight because this conversation didn't just happen when I was an undergrad. This conversation about Christianity and wealth has actually been going on since the very conception of the church with people really disagreeing with each other when it comes to this topic. Yeah, it's one of those things when you go back through church history or even go around the world, you find an enormous amount of different perspectives. People disagree on, on what good money is or whether money is good at all. They disagree about whether we should have personal and private possessions or whether we should be holding things in common. They disagree about the accumulation, saving and accumulation of wealth versus giving and being generous. There are just enormous discrepancies in terms of how we think about it that all emerge from people's reading of the same Bible and really the same New Testament. So let's take a few moments to take a look at some of these sorts of quotes and glimpses of people's thought about money. Okay, very first one. Uh, Andrew Murray, the world asks, what does a man own? Christ asks, how does he use it? Maybe it isn't how much money you have, maybe it's all about how you use that money for kingdom priorities. Uh, Ambrose says this, you strip people naked and dress up your walls, the naked poor cries before your door, and you do not even look at him. It is a naked human being that begs you, and you are considering what marbles to use for paving. Wow. Let's move on. That's way too convicting. <laughs> Go ahead with Tartellia. Yeah. So Tertullian makes this comment, besides, can a man be poor if he's free from want, or does he not and if he does not covet the belongings of others. Rather, he is poor who possesses much but still craves for more. Interesting, one of the things that Christians have done is defined rich differently, mm. exactly by what we do and don't crave rather than by what we do or don't possess. Here's a great quote from a, a colonial preacher, actually an early president of Harvard as well. Riches are consistent with godliness, and the more a man hath, the more advantage he has to do good with if God gives him a heart to do it. Interesting point. He says money, the more the better, as long as you have a heart to use it well. I was going to go to Harvard, but decided to go to Eastern Michigan. I can only imagine. Conscious. Yeah. <clears throat> Just use it well, Tim. Use it well. Uh, this quote about the Puritans, we're convinced that money, this is interesting, was a social good, not a private possession. Its main purpose is the welfare of everyone in society, not the personal pleasure of the person who happens to have control over it. Interesting thought. Uh, and we had a Piper quote. It didn't make they it. They cut it. I, they cut the Piper that quote. That was your quote, too. Yes. So John <laughs> Piper says this. Piper says, the idea of a tithe is merely the American Christian middle class ripping off God. I thought that's fascinating. I just wish Piper was more clear in what he would <laughs> communicate. Oh, there it is. My take on tithing is, Amer is in America is that it's a middle class way of robbing God, that you should give much more than 10%. That 10% thing is bogus, maybe even unbiblical, and we need to give much, much more than just 10%. So that gives you an idea of the 
breadth of the controversy and issues like that. Here's what we want to do now. I'm going to invite Scott Ray to come up and give us like a 10-minute biblical overview of biblical teaching on money, and then we're going to follow up and take a look at what we'll be talking about tonight. So Scott, come on up. Well, thank you all. I'm looking forward to I'm a panelist on the duologue tonight, and I promised, I promised my other panelists I wouldn't start giving my own position. But I just want to talk a little bit about why this area matters, why it's so important, and then a little bit about how we can read the Bible well when you talk about money and economics. Here's, when you look at the scripture in total, the reason this matters is, be, is indicated by the fact that the Bible has more to say about money and economic life than it does about heaven and hell put together. And you think about that, why, why is that? Well, there are several reasons. There's a theological reason, there's a practical reason, and then there's a really personal reason. The theological one is that with God becoming a human being in Christ, the incarnation tells us that both the material body and the material world matter really deeply to God. There's as much hope for your body in the scripture as there is for your soul, and your salvation is not just for yourself, but for the life of the world. And all, the, all of creation is groaning for its redemption at present, which suggests that it will all be redeemed at some point in the future. Another reason the Bible has so much to say about money and economic life is that there's hardly any aspect of our lives that is untouched by money and economics. Even our eternal salvation is put in economic terms. For example, the last words of Jesus on the cross when he said, it is finished, is actually an accounting term that means literally paid in full. It's an, it's an accounting mechanism. Um, and when Paul describes our justification in Romans 4, he, it's, it's again an accounting term that says when, it, when our faith is credited to us as righteousness, it's credited to, literally to our spiritual account on the credit side. Now, a third reason is really personal. And that is in the scripture, our attitude toward money is a mirror of what's going on in our heart. Actually, both our attitudes and our actions toward money actually reflect our heart. The good news is that our, our attitudes or our, the way we use our money can also move our heart as well. When Jesus says, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. What he indicates is that there are a handful of things in the Scripture that are mirrors to our deepest passions and priorities. And how we, how we talk about, how we think about, how we use our money is one of those that, if it's not at the top of the list, it's really, really close. It gives us an inside view of what's going on in our soul. But that really is too convicting, so we probably should move on. Through, throughout tonight's duologue, I suspect that m most of us on the panel will be invoking the Scripture from time to time as part of the biblical support for the points that we are making. And so what I want you to remember when you hear different people invoke the scripture on money and economics, is how to read the Bible well on this. And what, I think what we have to do is that sometimes we forget. We have to appreciate the vast differences that exist between economic life during biblical times and economic life today. It, I think it's hard to envision two worlds that are so totally different than the way economic life was done in Old and New Testament times in the way it's done today. Let me give you a handful of examples of this. For one, in the economic world of the Bible, the, the overwhelming majority of people made their living off the land in either subsistence agriculture or in some in small trades like the family of Jesus. But in the economic world of today, we have a dynamic, uh, bustling information and industrial economy, and hardly anybody today in the developed economies makes their living off the land the way they did in biblical times. Here's another difference that's really important. In the ancient world, the, the vast majority of people were stuck in the same socioeconomic st strata that they were born into. There was hardly any socioeconomic mobility where you could improve your economic standing. There were no rags to riches stories. There was no emphasis in the Bible on ambition because that would be sort of, you know, what for? Because there was really no there was no way for people to, to, get, to get ahead economically. Today, however, huge economic mobility is not only possible, but I suspect that most of you in this room expect that. 
fact, I suspect that most of you in this room believe, almost assume, that 10 years from now, you will be better off financially and economically than you are today. In the ancient world, nobody had vocational choices. In fact, if somebody from the ancient world came into our career center, they, I mean, they would, I mean, their head would explode. And they would think, well, what on earth is this for? This has no use at all because you, were, you did what your family did and you had hardly any choice. Today, we have a huge amount of vocational choice. We have, you know, we, we're encouraged to pursue our passions. The ancient world, they would think, huh? You, you pursue. Their passion was to actually have something to eat at the end of the day. In the ancient world, nobody retired. You worked until you either dropped dead or could no longer work. Uh, today, it's assumed that people will not work forever, that you will somehow be able to retire from working and to do other things with your life. Let me just sort of summarize it. The, the economy in the ancient world is what we call a zero-sum arrangement, which means that there's one pie that's fixed. The size of the economic pie was fixed, and if I get a bigger slice, then you get a smaller one. And wealth was gained in the ancient world primarily through taking. And literally, the, the wealth of the rich was gained at the expense of everybody else by taking it from them. That's why the prophet speaks so much about oppression and injustice in the economic realm. But today, it's totally different from that. Today, we have a dynamic wealth-creating economy where wealth is, is gained primarily through making something that somebody else wants. And it's, today, it's entirely possible to do well financially and to do good for your community at the same time. In the ancient world, that was virtually an oxymoron because the only way people got wealthy was, pri was, was through things that were ruled, I think, completely immoral and, and utterly faith-compromising. So that, that has big implications on how we read the Scripture when it comes to wealth and possessions. And so whenever, when you read the Bible on money and economics, I would suggest that you not only read the text for its face value, but ask yourself, why does the Bible say what it does about money and wealth and economic life? And some of the reasons the Bible says what it does has to do with some of these vast differences between the ancient world and today that we have to take into account. So I hope you'll come tonight. I think it'll be a really rich conversation. Uh, super looking forward. I am one of the participants. Uh, there's going to be five of us. So instead of a duologue, it's going to be a pentalogue. Uh, but it, it's going to be a fascinating conversation on all sorts of subjects uh, that have to do with money, wealth, and economics. When Christians tithe 10% of their income, are they acting in a biblical way? This may seem like an odd question because to tithe is a biblical term, so of course they're acting in a biblical way. And the tithe is mentioned multiple times in the Bible, both Old Testament and New Testament. The Israelites are called to tithe to the Levites, the Levites are called to tithe to the uh, chief priest, and um, Abraham mentions tithing to Melchizedek, Jacob mentions tithing to God, all of it 10%. And then um, in the New Testament, they mention a tithe. Uh, Hebrews mentions that tithe of uh, Abraham to Melchizedek. And in Matthew, Jesus mentions the tithe and he affirms it by saying uh, to the Pharisees, you should both tithe and you should uh, care for the poor. So how could I even question whether or not the tithe is biblical? As it turns out, the tithe as a Christian to give 10% is not biblical for two reasons. First. Uh, if you were trying to imitate what the Israelites did when they gave 10%, you actually, if you give 10%, are not giving enough. There are three separate tithes mentioned in the old Mosaic law. And so if you do the calculation to tithe according to the way the Israelites tithe, you should give between 17 and 23% of your income per year. Secondly, to tithe is Mosaic law, 
And to have a Mosaic law means you are yoking yourself uh, to that law and you are ripping yourself from the grace of Jesus Christ. So in the end, I don't think Christians should adhere to the uh, law of the tithe. So every society pools their resources to a certain degree. We don't all have equipment in our garages to fix the roads around our houses. Instead, we pitch in money and hire somebody to take care of all the roads in our neighborhood. That's how a society works. But the question is always how, to what degree, which things should we pitch in for and which things do we leave to everybody to take care of on their own? So for instance, in Canada, where I'm from, they've looked at how good it is for babies to be taken care of by their parents during the first year of their life. It helps them do better in school, less behavioral problems, things like that. And they've said, okay, let's pitch in money to help them be at home with their kids for the first year of their lives. That's something we haven't done in America. And in fact, even in a generous state like California and in a generous employer like Biola, I still went back to work with a three-month-old, which was hard and in some places actually a little bit dangerous. I was so tired I shouldn't have been driving, but I had to get to work. So the question is, when we think about something like that, maternity leave, health care, the cost of university education, are we morally obligated to be more helpful, to pitch in more, to help our society, to help everybody's lives get better? And even if we aren't, is it smart? Should we be doing it because it's wise? Each year, over 12 million workers work in forced slave labor at any given time. In the developing world, it's estimated that 250 million children work in sweatshops children between the ages of 5 and 14, usually for 16 hours a day. In the United States, over 40% of workers are not paid a living wage, work for less than a living wage, the wage necessary to meet one's basic needs without public assistance and set aside a little each month for emergencies and savings. Among African American workers, over 50% aren't paid a living wage. Among Latino workers, nearly 60% work less than uh, for less than a living wage. Why is that? Why is that so? The short answer is capitalism, an economic system that rewards business owners in proportion to their ability to get their workers to work as cheaply as possible, for as many hours as possible, with as little safety and frill as possible. Put in terms of the second love commandment, love your neighbor as yourself, Capitalism is an economic system that rewards business owners in proportion to their ability to get away with not loving their employees as much as they love themselves. Capitalism is an economic system in deep tension with the love ethics of the New Testament. Capitalism, I want to suggest, is immoral. But there's a better way, there's a better way of organizing our economic lives, one that's more compatible with the love ethics of the New Testament, one that we Jesus followers can start practicing now. And to give you a quick hint, it's not socialism. One of the most pressing questions on the intersection of Christian faith and economics today is the issue of economic inequality. To what degree is the growing inequality between the rich and the poor a moral problem that needs to be addressed? And I would say that, that is, is, is inequality a problem? Not necessarily. Uh, keep in mind that for most of the history of civilization, until about 1800, the vast majority of the world's population was strikingly equal. They were just equally poor, wretched, and miserable. And once market systems were introduced, once capitalism was introduced on a widespread scale, it created middle classes wherever it was tried, and therefore by definition created some inequalities. But for the most part, the, the, uh, the people who had been the poorest of the poor were able to improve their socioeconomic standing. Now there are a couple, of, a couple of occasions in which inequality does constitute a, a moral problem that needs to be addressed. And that is when it's the result of, of in some sort of injustice and when it gets to such a degree that people actually lose hope in their ability to improve their socioeconomic standing. But for the most part, I'd say inequality is not the problem. The problem is not that some people have more than others. The problem is that some people don't have enough. And therefore it's poverty, not inequality, that is the real problem to be addressed. So I, in this debate, I wanna make sure that we're actually shooting at the right target. Not inequality, but poverty. Is there poverty in the United States? I would suggest that while we may experience relative poverty in the United States that we don't experience absolute poverty in the United States. 
So what's the difference between the two? Absolute poverty is where you have the experience of extreme malnutrition and disease, where poverty is actually leading to those particular uh, things happening. Whereas relative poverty is poverty that's measured in relationship to another group or to a status community. So the question becomes, what groups are we comparing in the United States and does that have any type of comparison to what you would find in the slums of Kibera or in other parts of the world, especially the Global South, that experience extreme malnutrition and life-threatening disease? Poverty exists here, but it's not absolute poverty. What does that mean, even for us as Christians, who should be concerned about the poor? Is such a distinction even something that we should care about or think about if we're called to care for the poor and the marginalized and to restore hope to people? Why don't we experience poverty, at least absolute poverty in the United States? Well, we don't for many reasons often due to the fact that we do have safety nets here in the United States that don't exist in other places. So I invite you out to the dualogue where we talk about, is there poverty in the United States? How does poverty look different here than it does in other places, especially in the global South? And what should we as Christians do about it? Discover who you're called to be at Biola University, a leading Christ-centered university in Los Angeles, with programs on campus and online. Subscribe for more of our videos and learn more at biola.edu.